This is Curl Up with a Cat Tail, and I'm Gwen Cooper, the New York Times bestselling author of numerous cat-centric titles, including Homer's Odyssey, A Fearless Feline Tale, or How I Learned About Love and Life with a Blind Wonder Cat, Spray Anything, More True Tales of Homer and the Gang, and The Book of Possum, Head Bonks, Raspy Tongues, and 101 Reasons Why Cats Make Us So, So Happy. We're here to celebrate all things feline and to tell inspirational cat tales. Let's get started. Hello, and thanks so much for joining me for an all-new episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tale with Gwen Cooper. I am, of course, Gwen Cooper, your host, and thrilled as always to be here. Later on in this episode, we will be joined by Maya Bialik. Most recently of the Fox Network's Call Me Cat. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been watching that. I actually find it to be quite a delightful show, so hopefully you have. In a couple of weeks, we will be joined by author Cy Montgomery, whom I know many of you have read and enjoyed. I know that I have certainly enjoyed her books over the years. So if you have any questions that you would like me to ask Ms. Montgomery, head on over to GwenCooper.com and you can either leave those questions in the comment section or you can utilize the contact form on my website and shoot me an email. And let me know what you would like to know. You also can just leave general feedback about this podcast or any questions that you might have for me or comments or things you would like to hear me address on future episodes. And of course, if you like what we do here on Curl Up with a Cattail with Gwen Cooper, uh, reviews, particularly on iTunes, are always very much appreciated. And the only thing I ask is that you be honest in your feedback. Uh, If I sound a little stuffy this morning, by the way, it is because I've just finished an intensive round of spring cleaning. We are now officially into April. Spring has sprung. And so it is that time of year when it's great, especially after a year of quarantine. Uh, Not that Lawrence and I have not done some cleaning all along, but we really have been spending a lot more time at home recently um, and and if I'm being candid, not doing any really intensive cleaning like we probably should. So so we did the really intensive cleaning for the past few days, uh, you know, the kind where you you lift the rugs and you move the couch and you don't just dust a cabinet. You take everything out of the cabinet and clean it individually uh, which is really something that that we don't do often enough, as evidenced by the fact that when we moved the couch, I, I cannot even begin to tell you how many cat toys there were <laughs> underneath there. I, I'm talking well into three figures worth of cat toys. And it is just astonishing to me how many accumulate, especially over the course of a year when you're spending so much more time with your cats than you're used to? And and so you just kind of keep buying new ones because every time my cats get a new toy, it makes them happy. And and so that was just like a thing to do to kind of break up some of the monotony of not being able to go out to restaurants or out with friends or or to the theater or or to see movies or any of the things that that like the rest of you, uh, Lawrence and I usually do to to pass the time. And you know it's funny because my and I've written about this before, but my first three cats, uh, Scarlett, Vashtine, Homer, were not into toys at all. There was one toy. Uh, famously, that that stuffed worm toy that they all three loved, but that Homer really loved, and that we had for like over a decade, and and that Homer really just kind of wore down to a nub before we finally had to get rid of it. But other than that, they were not into toys. They they really could not have been less interested in toys. They loved the bags that toys would come in. And they loved receipts. Like, like you know, if I crumpled up the receipt, if I went out and bought toys at a pet store for my cats and came home, they would be interested in the bag that the toys came in. They would be interested in the receipt for the toys. If it was a catnip toy, there might be some interest. But honestly, Homer was really, really good at ripping catnip toys apart. So if it was a toy that a catnip toy that he could rip apart, he would do so within a very short period of time. And actually, if you go to YouTube, I remember When Homer's Odyssey first came out, USA Today 
sent over a, a, a producer and a camera person to get a recording of me reading an excerpt from Homer's Odyssey while Homer played with a catnip toy in the background. And over the course of that video, Homer just demolishes the catnip toy until at the end, it's, it's, it's nothing but a, a scrap of cloth on a big pile of catnip on the floor, which Homer then rubs his whole face in. So he kind of looks like Al Pacino at the end of Scarface <laughs> in this shot. He's, you know, really is a kind of, if, if you don't talk to your cats about catnip, who will? And, and so that was Homer's MO. So it wasn't so much that he was interested in the toys. He was interested in the catnip that was in them. If it was a sturdier kind of catnip toy, like, like one of those Yao cigars, where you can't really, the cats, it would be very difficult to, for a cat to, to tear that apart. Homer would only be interested until he figured out that he wasn't going to be able to rip it apart. And, and then he just had no interest at all. And Scarlet and Vashti also really liked catnip, but they liked loose catnip. They weren't as into it when it was in a toy. And I used to think that that was just how cats were, that, that cat toys were kind of a sucker game, like a con. Basically, it was a way of conning cat people out of their money with the, with the lure of buying something enter entertaining for your cat. And then, of course, realizing after the money had been spent that all you really did was spend the money for yourself, basically. Like, like the $5 that you spent was to make you feel good for maybe the 15 minutes between when you left the pet store and when you got home and realized that your cat was not at all interested in this toy or a group of toys that you had just spent the $5 on. That's kind of what I thought the point of cat toys was. I thought it was a sucker economy, basically. Uh, and then I learned with my current two cats, uh, uh, Clayton and Fanny, oh my God, I forgot their names for a second. Actually, no, it was not that I forgot their names. I was about to call them Scarlet and Vashti and Homer. I'm, I'm doing that thing. I remember uh, when I was a kid, my mom would call me by my sister's name or occasionally by the, the dog's name. And uh, before she got to my name, and, and I just had one of those moments, and you guys just heard it. And wow, it's a frightening thing, a senior moment. But anyway, Clayton and Fanny uh, really love toys. They love toys. They don't necessarily love any one toy for any length of time. Although occasionally there will be a toy that really goes the distance. Uh, Fanny in particular is really into toys that are furry or that have little feathers on them. And over the years, we've gotten a couple of toys from readers that have been made from real fur, uh, like from rabbit fur, which is not would not be my first choice of something to buy for the cats. But once they were here, I, I let the cats have them. And it actually, I, I guess, in a sense, turned out to be a good investment. And so far, Fanny has two toys that are made out of real fur. And she loves them. She has had them now for about five years, and she she does play with them every day. And every day she leaves at least one of them on my pillow uh, sometime between when I get up and when I go to bed. So that's Fanny's little gift to me every day, which is I, I, uh, I'm touched by the fact that she really does remember to do this literally every single day. Uh, but other than that, you know, the cats, they love toys, but for them, the excitement is getting the toy. They play with it. They play with it, if I'm lucky, for half an hour. And then eventually it ends up under the couch, under my desk, under the refrigerator. And and I'm ashamed to say that much like the cats, I, I really don't think about it. You know, I just get them another toy. I look around one day and I'm like, huh, we're really low on cat toys. And I go out and buy them something else the next time I am at the pet store getting them food. So I'm sure you can imagine the, the, the trove, the veritable toy graveyard that I found when Lawrence and I moved the couch so that we could dust underneath it. Um, and, and it was just this really intense combination of, of dust and cat fur and old toys. And it's just amazing. You, you know, we've only been in this house for around two years, almost exactly two years. Actually, it was two years ago this week that we moved here. And and just the sheer volume of toys that have accumulated under the couch. And and I was going to say this is just evidence of how spoiled my cats are. But really, what it's really evidence of is A, how forgetful I am. And B, how <laughs> frequently I clean under the couch. Because an argument could certainly be made that if I were cleaning under the couch as often as I ought to, I would long since have discovered this trove of toys. So... More the fool I, I suppose. I, I have no one but myself to blame. And, and I guess that's why Clayton finds it so fascinating 
when I clean because he does. And and in fairness, Clayton just always likes to be involved in anything that I'm doing. Uh, you know, I um I told someone recently that I've had to learn how to do everything that I do one-handed, uh whether it is reading a book or or typing or just about anything that I do because I always have to have one hand patting Clayton at any given time. And and that is almost literally true. I, I can say that probably a good 90% of the time Clayton is 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 right there with me, glued to my side. And definitely needs a lot of attention and active petting. And so when I clean the house, I, I think it is it is partly intriguing to Clayton insofar as I am doing all of these strange and exotic things that he is not used to seeing me do on a regular basis. And and again, I do have to emphasize here that we we are not necessarily a sloppy household, but we are also very far from from having one of those fastidiously clean houses either. So I, I think when, when Clayton sees me dusting and vacuuming and wiping down the stovetop and washing windows and, and really making the house sparkling, he his attitude must be, what is this strange behavior that my human is engaging in? I must investigate further uh, because he, he's just not used to seeing me do these things. And so I think it's partly that. And then partly he also just really has a need to be involved in anything that I'm doing. He really does not like not being with me. It is very, very hard when I'm recording my audio books, and I hope to be doing more of that in the very near future. It is very, very hard to keep him out of my little recording space. And in fairness, he is usually pretty quiet. Like right now, you can't even really tell that he's here. He's sleeping very quietly in my lap. But he does like to be involved in just about everything I do. And so what ends up happening when I'm cleaning is that he gets a little hyper, you know, because I'm constantly in motion and I'm walking from one end of the room to the other or, or you know, to, to empty a dustpan or to wring out a dust cloth or whatever the case may be. And he is trying to keep up with me and it really does get him all wound up. Although the good news is that eventually he crashes and and sleeps very hard, uh, usually all night, which is good news for Lawrence and me insofar as the cats will usually wake us up at least once in the middle of the night wanting attention or wanting to play or, or just the sound of them running around in the house. But uh, on the days that I clean, that Clayton is down for the count all night. And that is never a bad thing. It makes him a very, uh, a, a much more what's the word I'm looking for? Congenial bed companion. So that's what we've been up to around here in the last few days and since the last episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tail. And speaking of spring cleaning and the last episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tail, I did want to just thank everybody for all your incredibly kind and supportive words and, and outreach. And I would also like to thank just the tremendous outpouring of people who came over to Patreon and who are now supporters and, and members of our community on Patreon, which I'm thrilled to see growing. And it is really becoming a lot of fun and everything that I envisioned that it could be. And, and I certainly hope some more of you will consider joining us over there at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Gwen Cooper. There's going to be a new episode of our Lawrence Loves Gwen bonus podcast with Lawrence posting in just a couple of days. So those of you who are hanging out with us over on Patreon. I hope you will check that out. And i it's actually too many new patrons for me to read everybody's name in this podcast. So I'm going to read about half of them now, and half of them will, will, I will give you your shout out next week. So if you are a supporter on Patreon who has come on within the past couple of weeks and you don't hear me say your name, I will be saying your name next week. And if I don't say it next week either, please, by all means, you know, send me an email and say, hey, dummy, you didn't say my name. And so with no further ado, here is uh, the the list of new patrons who have come on since last week. And I just want to thank you again, because truly your patronage does make it possible for me to do this podcast and to write my books and to do both of those things 100% independently, not only of traditional publishers, but also of corporate sponsors and advertisers. And so those new patrons are Dawn Brown, Cindy Pierce, Lisa Calarese, Marion Harding, Carol Lofton, Matthew O'Leary, Kathy Mancini, Rihanna Nicole, Catherine Mayer, Shelley Bamfield, Christina Erdeljohn, Julie Burns, Eddie Green, 
Katie Williams, Catherine Larkland, Suzanne Dunaway, Heather, last name withheld, Natalie Plummer, Marjorie Gray, Andrew Kaplan, Joanne Newman, Jamie Forster, Margaret Tucker, and Elizabeth Marangelo. And again, if I have mispronounced your name or, or, or butchered it in any way, I do apologize. And please feel free to send me an email and let me know the correct pronunciation of your name so that I do not mispronounce it. And again, if you are a patron at the $5 level or higher, you will be getting a shout out here once a month. So you do want to be sure that, that you don't have to listen every month to me butchering your name. And it would certainly make me sad to think that I was doing so. So thanks again to all of you, those of you who support me on Patreon, and also everybody who listens, everybody who reads my book. Again, you are the reason. I, it's not just that I couldn't do it without your support. I wouldn't do it without you. There, there would literally be no point in doing so. And so thanks for giving me a reason to do these things that I so enjoy doing. And of course, one of the things that I enjoy doing most is talking to other cat lovers. And in a few minutes, we will be talking to cat lover, actress, and all-around fun person, Maya Bialik. So stay put, get comfortable, and stay tuned for more Curl Up With a Cat Tail. Thanks so much for sticking around. I am delighted to introduce this week's guest. You know her as the star of hit network TV shows, including Blossom, The Big Bang Theory, and most excitingly for us, Call Me Cat, airing Thursday nights on Fox. She's also the author of four books, the host of the podcast, My and Bialik's Breakdown. She'll be making her directorial debut this summer with the film As Sick As They Made Us, which she also wrote, starring Dustin Hoffman and I believe Candace Bergen. And she has a PhD in neuroscience. In addition to all of that, she's a mother of two, a dedicated cat rescuer, and human servant to three fantastic felines, Francis, Annie, and Nermal. Please join me in offering a warm welcome and a zizin Pesach to Mayim Bialik. Hello. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, and yeah, it's Zizin Pesach. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank so, you. Happy you... Passover. Thank you. Did you get to to do kind of a, a halfway normal Seder this year? Kind of. I mean, it's not my preference to do Seders outside, but that's what we did this year. And at least we could be with my mom. Last year, we could not be with my mom. Um, my mom is fully vaccinated. We still choose to socially distance because that seems to be what everyone's comfort level is right now. But it was really, really amazing to all get to physically be in one place. And was it the first big gathering since the, the pandemic has started? Yeah, I'd say this is the first meal we've had with my mom that wasn't, you know, just like take out in her backyard from across the <laughs> across the yard. <laughs> now, so did you get to because for me, what quarantine uh, Passover has meant is that for the first time I have have because uh, it was just my husband and me this year and I decided to actually do a Seder last year. We kind of skipped it. Um, and, and I made all of the, the food myself at, without my mom or my mother-in-law. And, and that was kind of a first time thing for me. I don't know how it is in, in your family, but I, I definitely mm -hmm. shamefacedly left the heavy lifting to the, uh, more experienced <laughs> chefs in the family. And my matzo balls were not as good as my mother's. And I asked her what her secret was. And she told me a small, the smallest possible pinch of yeast. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So that means that every Seder I've ever had has been a lie. Basically. <laughs> a little bit. Well, we are, uh, we are, we are vegan and we are traditional uh, Eastern European Jews. So we also don't eat any kidney oat, which is like no beans, no peas, no corn. Um, it's an added stringency, which on top of being vegan makes Passover a challenge, but we essentially eat unprocessed, you know, for the whole time. And that's kind of cool. Sure. But I would have to, so I would have to wonder being vegan on Passover. Um, and for people who are listening, Passover, one of the rules of, of observing Passover is that you don't eat anything that causes bread to rise, basically. So no traditional breads, no pasta. That's why we eat matzah. Um, so it must be an especially restrictive holiday food wise, I would think. It's very, yeah, it's a real challenge because we don't eat eggs and that's, you know, what is usually in most Passover food is right. eggs. 
So, yeah. And because we, you know, are pretty observant, we also don't eat all the foods that we normally eat throughout the year. So even all the vegan cheeses and all those things which are kosher, they're not kosher for Passover. So, yeah, it's a very interesting week. <laughs> it sounds like it would be. I'm guessing your kids are going to have some interesting tor- stories to tell when they get older. Oh, they, oh I said, if this is the if this is the worst thing about your life, I think we're doing okay. <laughs> That's a very that is a very very fair point. Um, and and for that, I'm going to springboard from the good things in life. I'm going to springboard into cats. Um, <laughs> that, that we call it a segue in the business, by the way. It was a <laughs> little bit of a rough segue. Um, but I did want to talk to you about your show, Call Me Cat, and which I know began as a BBC show called Miranda about a single woman who owns a joke shop. And I'm just curious to know how early in, in the conversations between you and Jim Parsons about bringing the show here, did you decide to make it a cat cafe? That was actually um, a pitch from Darlene Hunt, who was our showrunner the first year and Um, our executive producer, it was a suggestion of hers. And I don't know if she knew that I loved cats, but that definitely worked for me. (laughs) You know, I I watched the show and the cats seem extraordinarily well behaved. Mm -hmm. I I mean, just over the course of the years, you know, camera crews have come here trying to film my cats and it has just never gone nearly as well as it seems to go on the set of your show. Yeah. So um, our cats are not drugged and they're not tethered. I <laughs> say. Well, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, no, but that, that is what it is with a lot of, especially cats. It literally sets. never occurred to me that that's oh, horrible. Yeah. That is no, horrible. Well, that's, I mean, they used to also drug women during labor. So, you know, <laughs> fair <laughs> like, enough. Um, no, our cats, uh, many are ragdoll cats, meaning that's the breed and they are very, very happy to sit. I mean, God bless them. Someone should be. Um, so. Many of them are ragdoll breeds, which makes it a lot easier. And they are trained, which means they are raised in a in a trainer's care and love. And they are extremely obedient. They do things on command. And absolutely, we get cats who go rogue and like run off in the middle of a scene. Some cats are so used to attention that they will cry unless they're being held in a scene. And it's really literally they find, you know, they find cats that have great personalities. They socialize them very, very young. And we also get to um, sometimes have a, a visiting kitten or puppy that is just learning to be around a set. Because I think that's the the largest limitation is all the people and all the noise and the unexpected noise that happens that they have to get acclimated to. You know, one thing I love about your show is is that it you you work re- the idea of, of cat rescue so organically into the plot. There are always little subplots or, or mentions about this cat or that cat who has found a forever home. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if any of the cats who appear on the show are actually rescues or are they all quote unquote working cats who Yeah, who those are those there? are all act yeah, those are all actor cats. Okay. Who, um yes, who already have homes. Um we do have you know, we have a little billboard. It's just like part of our set dressing that actually has cats and descriptions of them that our props department decided to write up about imaginary cats who need homes. Uh. <laughs> uh, but no, those are all working cats. And so you have three cats of your own. And I, I know you've spoken in the past about cats being particularly great pets to raise kids with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you would like to, and, and I'm sure it, you would find a very receptive audience here on my show if you wanted to expound on that point a little more. Yeah. I mean, look, I know that some people are dog people and that's totally fine. Um, but, you know, to me, I, I like to say I have children. I don't need dogs, meaning I have <laughs> I've had <laughs> things in my life that needed me to like a help lot of attention. Go to the bathroom. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a lot of attention and kind of like you know, when you think about a toddler who's like always like, oh, my God, we woke up today. Like, I don't really necessarily <laughs> crave that experience. And and I've learned that that's what many dogs are like. Like every day is like, oh, my God, you're home. And I, just, I, I grew up with dogs and, and that is not an inapt description. Yeah, um, it's just yeah. not it's not my vibe. And so for me, um, having two children who happen to be very mellow, they they also would not do well with that. Um that kind of vibe. And the cat vibe is just more us, you know, they're independent. They tell you kind of when they need something. And, uh, if they don't, they generally are, are easygoing. Um, you know, we've got one cat that's not super friendly. And then we have two that like want to be held all day. And it's, you know, to me, it's a very contained set of chores that kids learn, you know, with a dog, there's like walking and like having to hold their poop in, through a bag and it's warm and I can't, yeah, whereas that's, like we, yeah, it's we, we learned to, 
yeah, we learned to take care of the litter box. We have indoor cats. And um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of skills and chores that they get to learn without us needing to leave the house in the middle of the night. I, I, I actually, and, and this is true, I turn into that crazy. So it snowed for almost the entirety of February here in New Jersey. And there's something, and I don't know if this is just a Jersey thing. I, I grew up in Miami, so I don't know if this is just a Jersey thing. I didn't see it in Manhattan, but when it snows, People with dogs, they walk their dogs and then they just leave their poop on a pile of snow. Yeah, that's as, not as okay. if the snow like transmutes <laughs> poop in some like the, the transubstantiation of of dog poop. And and yes, not I okay. <laughs> finally yelled out my <laughs> window with someone who had a very large dog, a very large German Shepherd who had left a very large pile of poop um, across the street from my house. And I live in a, this like three story Victorian house that's on a little rise. So I was very high up. What in, in the creepy old house when I was yelling, truly had like old widow Cooper, you know, and um, but I, I I couldn't help it. Like, it's not the zombie apocalypse. It's no, you know, right. You Clean up your poop. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to talk. So so you have three cats, Francis, Annie and Normal. And okay. what I would love is is to actually quickly hear the, the story behind the name Normal, which I think is a great name. But I know you have an amazing adoption story behind Addie's adoption that, that I know my listeners are going to love. And, and so that I definitely would love to hear. Yeah, for sure. Um, Nermal, uh, very briefly is Garfield's adorable little cousin. If you remember ah. the Garfield strip, Nermal was that like his cousin who was always like up in his face with like super long lashes, like being adorable and Garfield hated him. And, um, we just thought that that's a good name <laughs> for this. So is this something that literally anyone who'd read Garfield comics as a kid, which is pretty much anyone would know except me. I, <laughs> I mean, usually people, when I remind people, they're like, Oh, right. He had that annoying cousin and normal is gray and normal, you know, in the cartoon strip was also gray. So that's where we got the name normal. Um, okay. And we call him Ner- Nermy, Squirmy Nermy, because he is a squirmy cat. You always um, have to have. Are there like little songs that you sing where you riff oh, like a, on it's the disgusting. name? It's disgusting. It's completely disgusting what happens in our house. There's <laughs> songs, names, dances. It's like all over town <gasps> at party. Um, but Addie, uh, her full name is Adamantium, which is um, what is inside Wolverine for any X Men fans out there. Yeah, the reason she's named Adamantium is. Um, Addie was born without a pectoral muscle, which is your chest muscle. In humans, it's called Poland syndrome and um, usually is not a, pr- a problem besides some, um, well, some aesthetic issues in humans and, and some, some functional uh, challenges. But in cats, they need a, a, a surgery to make sure that their heart has room to grow. So um, I met Addie because I was on a local New York uh, talk show. It was like Good Day New York. It was one of those. And they were doing a clear the shelters. It was, I think, like a Friday, you know, before the weekend or something mm-hmm. where they bring on, you know, an animal from the shelter to try and encourage people to, you know, reach out. And so I met this kitten in the uh, green room. And indeed, she was kind of floppy. Like she didn't stand like a normal cat. And okay. she clearly had problems because, as I found out, she was born without a pectoral muscle. So, um, I said to the woman who ran the shelter, I said, I mean, she's a beautiful cat. She's a tuxedo cat. And I said, um, if no one adopts this animal, will you, will you please let me know? And sure enough, no one adopted her based on her little appearance because she did need a surgery. And, um, I ended up, I was coming back to New York a couple of weeks later for the end of my book tour. And I brought Addie home. She at that time had had her surgery. Carol Alt, the uh, supermodel, was actually part of this shelter. It's Shelter Chic. And um, Carol had funded Addie's surgery. So when I got her, she was in a cast from her little tiny neck, uh, pretty much all the way down her torso. And I I cared for her for the first three months um, that I had her. You know, she was like just a couple months old when we got her. Um, and what kind of a cast. And what did that care involve uh, with her being in such a large um, cast? Well, I mean, I know it sounds kind of silly, but like, you know, she learned ways to sleep. She couldn't really sleep on her side um, because it was it was too heavy. So she would mostly sleep literally on her stomach with her head like face down, buried Aww. against. The, it was very, very cute. Um, and yeah, once the cast came off, um, you know, she could finally move. You know, she could jump and run and play. And, um, I told my children when we adopted her that we we don't know if her heart will be okay, but we're going to give her the best home and siblings. And, um, 
So she joined our family. She never really grew much, which is great because normal was the runt. So now I have, we call them the kittens because they're, they're basically kitten Kitten size size. still. I mean, they're, you know, they look like toddler cats Sure. and, um, she's been fine. So we call her Addie and, um, she also is slightly deaf. We're not sure if it's something congenital related to, you know, her other challenges. What color Uh, are her eyes out of curiosity? Uh, they're kind of goldish, you know, they're a goldish greenish, but she, um, she has very, really beautiful tuxedo marking. She has a mask, essentially. She has a black mask on. So we also thought of calling her Zorro. And um, anyway, so that is our Addie story. She's also our special needs rescue. And the funny thing is uh, my publicist, Heather, and I were on the way back from this publicity tour and we had first class tickets because, you know, that was what was paid for for our trip. Sure. And um, they would not allow me to travel in first class with this tiny kitten. And she was in a carrier. We had let them know. Um, they had some policy. I don't know what it was, but, um, I, I ended up sitting in coach with two strangers next to me who were like, why is my Bialik sitting in coach with a cat? <laughs> um, and, uh, I, I told Heather to keep her seat in first class. So I would wave to her and I had my cat in, in coach with all these new friends they yell who wanted at you to hold for, my cat. For like waving at the first class people sitting in coach yeah, because I, I mean, that, I'm told that, they that can be the icing, that. Yeah, that would have been the icing on the cake. <laughs> And I was like, I could have been sitting there, but this cat is having me sit here. So that's Addie's story. She's our very special, special needs rescue. All my cats are actually rescues, but obviously her story is really special. You know, it's funny when I moved to New York from Miami with my three cats. Um, and and so I flew with them in the cab and I would, was not going to check them as luggage. And, and I had mm-hmm. two friends fly up with my with with two of my cats and my third cat, Homer, the one who who is blind, who he mm-hmm. has no eyes. And so I flew with him and the policy was two cats per cabin. You know, each cat had to be Mm -hmm. with one passenger and then two cats per cabin. So we had the opposite experience where I had to fly first class (laughs) and, um, and Homer who, whose ears were, were incredibly sensitive because of his blindness did not deal well with the pressure changes of air travel and let everyone in first class know very (laughs) loudly how unhappy he was. You were that lady. (laughs) Yeah. So no one knew who I was. It wasn't like, why is Gwen Cooper in our, but, but they're what, what, why, (laughs) why am I sitting in first class and having to go through this? And, uh, it was a uh, it was a tough experience, but but travel yep. with cats is always uh, it's a whole other story. <laughs> it's never dull, no. But it's uh, I, I think it's a you know again a a great addition to a family and a great way to to talk to kids about things about differences among people and different needs and and totally. opportunities. You know that that everybody deserves. Were you always a cat person growing up, or is this something? Yeah, you- I was. No, I was raised with cats. Um, yeah, I was always raised with cats never, I mean, my, my grandmother was a real animal person and she was a dog person, but that was way too high maintenance for my parents. So yeah, we were, we were cat people and I grew up with indoor outdoor cats, um, which I would never do, (laughs) but uh, at the time, you know, there was less kind of, you know, there was less, um, talk about it. Well, we were um, indoor I'm, outdoor kids. I, I mean, I think it yeah, was just a whole different philosophy yeah. of, of, you know, free range pets and free range kids and, and just very different yeah, philosophies all the totally. way around. Totally. But no, as an adult, I have, um, yeah, just indoor cats. So yeah, always been a cat person. There are certain dogs that are interesting to me, um, but <laughs> the notion of having to walk them and like that whole bit no, not at all. <laughs> Uh, and and again, fair enough. I have appreciated that more as I now that I live someplace with uh with you know inclement weather in the winters. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm I'm interested to know your opinion on this. I, I've seen a lot over the years. There have been a lot of books or or attempts to explain um certain neurally typical conditions or behaviors in the context of cats. And I don't know if you're familiar with books like All Cats Have Asperger's Syndrome, for example. Oh yeah, yes. And um and I just wonder as a neuroscientist how meaningful a framework you you find that for understanding understanding either cats or neurally, you know, atypical conditions? Um, well, I mean, it's a good question. You know, obviously I wouldn't look to diagnose all cats with Asperger's um, <laughs> either. As a you heard it here or, first folks. <laughs> right. Or as a neuroscientist. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, I do have very sensitive children and my younger one in particular is very, very emotionally tuned in. And um, I've found that um, he identifies with you know, I think our cat's moods and their um, very particular needs in ways that I don't think he would with a dog. Um, you know, I, I really love kind of that cats can be up and down. 
because I think it's an important lesson <laughs> sure. in the world. Yes. Um, and, you know, obviously dogs have their moods, but um, it's kind of interesting that, you know, the energy of cats really works in our family for that reason, um, because they get to, and I don't mean that people with Asperger's are up and down, but what I mean is not everyone wants to be touched all the time. Right. And that's something that I've, you know, had to teach my kids from the time they were born, you know, um, cats don't always want to be touched all the time, just like you don't. And, um, you know, there's been a really interesting set of, of lessons around that, that I think are very important and that carry over into how we interact with humans. So in that sense, I think cats are a great, you know, a great, um, kind of tool, especially yeah, well, I think for, cats force for you to have kids. manners. You know, I think it's, uh, I mean, they, they do to a certain extent. Cats no, it really, really is about, it's manners. about their, right. It's about their needs. And, right. you know, um, in, in a Western culture, it's, I think it's very, uh, typical to be like, but I want love and I'm ready right now. <laughs> and so I want it. And, you know, cats are here to be like, no, I'll let you know when I'm ready. And it's learning that space that is very important. Look, it's important with humans. I don't think I've learned that lesson with humans yet. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you, you and me both on that one. <laughs> but um, I, I'm going to ask you one more question about the cats, because I do want to give us time to talk about your podcast and your upcoming film. Um, but I, so I always have to ask this of guests, is something, and, and you may not have an answer to this question, but something embarrassing that only your cats have seen you do. <laughs> um. I mean, my cats have seen me cry in ways that no human should. <laughs> hey, it's uh, like, like the big, like, <laughs> like, yeah, like, like the big, sad, ugly. They've, yes, they've definitely. Seen, they've seen cries that have made them come over to me and right. see what's wrong. <laughs> They're like, we're not normally empathetic animals, but seriously, what's up? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been there. <laughs> I've <laughs> definitely been there. Um so I, I do want to talk about your your podcast a little bit, um, and I've listened to a couple of episodes, uh, but I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So so tell us a little bit about your podcast. I, I think it's fairly new. Yes, it just started in January. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I started working on it over the last year, you know, over the COVID year, and uh, we talk about mental health, all things mental health, and it's not like a I'm a celebrity, I've figured it out kind of show. It's a I'm a celebrity who grew up struggling a tremendous amount with mental illness, um, I still live with many features of mental illness that are not fixed or resolved. And here are the things that, you know, worked and here's the things that didn't. And we have guests on who share those things as well, what worked for them and what didn't. We also talk to experts um, and it's been really, really incredible. You know, it's been a real journey. Uh, we've talked about, you know, anxiety and depression to, to coming out of the closet to, um, you know, uh, drug and addiction issues. Um, we, we've covered a lot. We've just covered schizophrenia. I mean, we're, we're hitting all the bases and it's been really amazing. I think for, for me as a listener, what I really appreciate about, appreciate about it is that you do come from the, this academic background and, and so we're able to speak to mental health issues from, from that academic perspective. And yet there's also very human, both in, in your stories and in the guests that you have, the, the human component as well. And for sure. So it, it's, it's educational, but it, it's also, it, it's, it's easy to connect to the stories yeah. that people are telling. And, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in learning more to, to check it out. It's, it's a really interesting podcast. Thank um, you. Yeah. And so this is where I'm going to, to have to, I, I did a little bit of, you know, I obviously know something about you coming into this and I did a little bit of research and, and here's where it all ends, my base of knowledge. Um, <laughs> and this is going to be talking about your film. The only thing I will note, or this is a question at, that I have to ask out of curiosity, because um, I do want you to tell us about your movie. And I, I think I read somewhere that Candace Bergen was attached and I was mm -hmm. a tremendous Murphy Brown fan. Mm -hmm. So my, one of my earliest my embiolic memories was you start was you guest starring on right. an episode of Murphy Brown as as like like the little it was an episode of right. where each character on the show on this news this fictional news show got a young uh, counterpart basically like right. to follow them and so you were the one who was assigned to to Murphy Brown you were the the little go getter. Yeah. Um, who I so totally related to. And I'm just curious if you, if you ever ended up working with Candace Bergen again, or if this would be um, your first reunion. Yeah, this would be my first reunion. And, and she and I talked about that when I met with her about this film. Um, so she remembered and, 
um, I was actually filming Blossom at that time. I, um, I popped over and did a guest spot on her show that I had been booked for. Um, but yeah, Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen are starring as are Simon Helberg and Diana Agron. Um, and I did write this script. It does focus around mental illness and it's about, um, a family struggling with, um, kind of the, the fallout of, of mental illness, which we didn't really use to talk about. So, um, you know, so I wrote it. It is not a memoir. It's not an autobiography. There's obviously bits of my story and bits of a lot of stories in there. Um, and we are filming actually in New Jersey this summer. All right. So this is going to be my last question. This is strictly fan service for me personally. So I just to apologize in advance to, to any, to my, to my audience. Um, so I am a huge Bette Midler fan. My mm-hmm. husband is a huge Lainey Kazan fan. Um, <laughs> like, like honestly, if Lainey Kazan were 25 to 30 years younger and, and in some way available to my husband, I would actually be in trouble. That is no joke. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously the, the first thing, the first thing I saw you in, and this may be the, one of the first things you did was playing young Bette Midler in the movie Beaches. Mm-hmm. And you were this little girl with this huge voice. And, and it was uh, a, a very astonishing thing to witness. Uh, but I, I have to, I would not be doing my husband <laughs> justice if I did not ask if you have any Lainey Kazan stories <laughs> that I could share with him. <laughs> I don't know if I have any stories. I mean, she's, you know, she's an incredible force um, to work with and to get to watch work Um, that, you know, I had been acting about a year when I was cast in beaches. So to get to, you know, just share a makeup trailer and, you know, all that with, with Lainey was unbelievable. Um, I remember it was the first time I saw, they kind of had to, you know, age her down and then age her up for that movie. So the first time I got to see some of how like makeup magic works, I remember that. Um, But I mean, I was so young. Uh, she was lovely to work with and she did some ad libbing that was actually in the movie. So some of that was her ad libbing about the camel when he says, like, when she says, I got to have a sip. Like, so she was very, very, very clever, really lovely. She always exudes such a warm presence on, oh, yeah, on screen. And so it's great to hear that she actually is, you know, oh, yeah. um, uh, that, that she is that you, you always like to hear. It's always it's always such a bummer to find out that somebody who seems so warm on screen is actually not <laughs> in in real life. Um, well, I think that about covers it. I thank you so much. I know that you actually have uh, another podcast to get to, uh, in the next few minutes. So I thank you for sticking with us for this long. Thank you. And it's really a pleasure to talk to you and for everything you do. And thanks to all of you for listening and I will see you next week. And that concludes this episode of Curl Up with a Cat Tail with Gwen Cooper. Don't forget to invite your feline-loving friends to listen to new episodes along with you. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, find out how to get your name and your cat's name included in my next book, or leave comments or questions for me to answer in future podcasts, head on over to GwenCooper.com now. Thanks so much for joining me, and don't forget to hug your cat today.